All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so again, I'm Dr. Jeff Stanley, and I'm a physician with Verda Health. And today's presentation, we're going to be talking about ketogenic diets and whether they're worth the hype. So just a little spoiler alert, um, they are. And I'll be able to give you some of the data behind why this is a really effective and innovative intervention for people with type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, and metabolic syndrome. In Verda, we're a clinically proven treatment to reverse type 2 diabetes safely and sustainably and without medications or surgery. Our mission is to reverse type 2 diabetes in 100 million people by 2025. Um, now, obviously, that sounds like a pretty bold goal, um, but what you'll see today in the presentation is that it actually is, is achievable. Um, and the reason for that is that there is you know, decades of nutritional science um, showing that a low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet is extremely effective for type 2 diabetes. Um, in addition, you know, we're now living in a time where we can utilize telemedicine so you can see your doctor from the comfort of your own home through your smartphone or computer. Um, you can get tech, uh, text messaging and personalized coaching on the go. Um, and what we really work to do at Verda is to kind of meet patients where they are and to make this as, um, you know, as, as easy as possible to be able to really revolutionize your health. So to give yourself a, a little more background about me, um, I got my MD at the University of Southern California. Uh, I'm board certified in internal medicine and also a diplomat of the American Board of Obesity Medicine. And you know, in addition to my experience, uh, as previously I was a primary care provider, um, working with patients and a lot of times utilizing you know, nutritional changes in order to help people get off of medications. Um, but you know, in addition to using this in my uh, professional life, um, I also wanted to give you just a bit of background about how my personal experience has really shaped uh, the way that I treat patients. And basically, you know, kind of goes back to growing up as a kid, I was always sort of a chubby kid. And, you know, like a lot of people, you know, struggled with my weight and then went off to college and gained the freshman 15 and kind of shot right past that. And, you know, what, what I tried was the old method of, you know, trying to eat less and exercise more. Uh, you know, trying to eat a low fat diet and, you know, restrict calories as much as I could and exercise like crazy. And, you know, like most people, I've found that that just didn't work. It was a recipe for feeling lousy, uh, feeling tired, and for not being successful. Um, so I was really lucky in that I, uh, on the recommendation of a family member, I started doing a low carbohydrate way of eating and have basically, I, I lost about 40 pounds and I've been able to keep that weight off ever since. Um, so this is something where I truly practice what I pre preach. And it's also a big reason why I know that this can be a sustainable lifestyle because I've been eating this way more than 15 years. Um, you can see in the corner there, there are, those are my two boys, uh, Will and Jack. And we also have a, a new daughter, just a couple months old. And part of why I show them, other than just bragging, is that they're actually enjoying a very low carbohydrate friendly dessert of uh, whipped cream and blueberries. Um, so this is to say that you know this is actually a way of eating that you can uh, use with a busy family and uh, you know picky kids or a picky spouse, and that again, really making this a sustainable lifestyle. So in today's presentation, uh, first I want to give you just kind of an outline of what we're going to cover. Um, so during the presentation, we'll be discussing, first of all, what is a ketogenic diet? Um, then we'll talk about nutrition's impact on chronic disease. Uh, we'll talk about the specifics of ketogenic diets and disease reversal versus management, um, and then go briefly into our approach at Verda and how this um, really allows people to, again, get off medications and improve their health. A um, couple of other points I wanted to make. So one thing you should see on your webinar toolbar is that you can ask questions as we go. I'm going to save some time at the end for a question and answer. So anything that comes up, whether it be about the presentation or about any specifics, you know, go ahead and pop those in. I would ask that you enter uh, your name just as anonymous um, because other people can see the questions as they come up. Um, 
And then the one thing is that sometimes there are some very specific questions about, you know, whether you qualify for the program. And that is going to differ based on your employer, also based on specific health issues. And those are things we can't necessarily address as a group. So if you have any questions about those, you can definitely email us. Um, and also at the end of this presentation, you'll get um, an email basically with, with a video of the presentation. So you'll be able to rewatch it or show it to others if you want. And then in addition, you also get information sort of specifically how to apply through your employer. So we'll go ahead and get started then. So the first thing, you know, when we're talking about what is a ketogenic diet, it's important to have a couple of quick definitions. Uh, so one thing uh, is that, you know, there are basically four main macronutrients. And these are very broadly carbohydrates, fats, protein, and alcohol. So carbohydrates, you know, that could be whether that's bread, sugar, uh, pasta, potatoes. Um, fat um, can be either sort of added fat, so things like butter, olive oil, or it can be the fat that is contained within a food, such as within avocado or within, uh, you know, the steak. And then next we have protein. And again, protein is a component of things like steak, uh, fish, eggs, um, but it also comes from plant sources. And then finally we have alcohol. And it's important to note that this should not make up a major portion of your diet. Um, however, it is considered a macronutrient. And one question we get quite frequently is whether people can actually you know, enjoy a little bit of alcohol in moderation with a low carbohydrate diet. And the answer is absolutely yes. If that's something that you, that you enjoy in moderation, then that is totally fine to do and we actually have some pointers about you know, which ones will not raise your blood sugar. So we have these main macronutrients. And let's think about the way a well-formulated ketogenic diet is made up. Uh, so the first thing that's really important is that it is low in carbohydrates. So um, the next thing is that it is moderate in protein, so not a very high protein diet. And then it tends to be high in fat. And that's the one that sometimes people, I think, have a little bit of a hurdle to get over. Um, but in fact, show you that eating natural, healthy sources of fats actually is a, a very sustainable and healthy way to eat. And in fact, also really targets blood sugar, which is the thing that we want to target with diabetes. So now I want to talk about some myths. Um, so these are some things that people think a ketogenic diet is. And one of the things with high protein. So again, I mentioned it actually tends to be a moderate protein diet. Um, another myth we hear is that it's energy zapping or it gives people brain fog. And what we see is that actually once people are adapted to a ketogenic diet, they actually report better mental clarity. Uh, more energy. And this can be a little bit of a transition period. So it might take a week or two for your body to get used to burning fat as its main fuel. But the important thing to know that that's transient and that we can help get you through that. Uh, next thing is that you might have heard that it's bad for cardiovascular vascular health. And in fact, we have published data and there's a, a number of other studies that show that in fact, it improves cardiovascular health markers. So things like cholesterol, blood pressure, and other markers. Um, another thing that people often hear is ketoacidosis versus nutritional ketosis. And I'll go into more detail about what this is. But the important thing to note is that nutritional ketosis is a normal natural state when you cut carbs. Ketoacidosis is a harmful state that occurs when people are no longer able to make insulin in their own body. Um, we also might hear that this requires frequent fasting, which is something that we don't recommend in terms of long, pro, uh, prolonged fasting. Um, you might hear that it's very restrictive, but that there are limited food choices. And in fact, what we find is that people get the okay to enjoy a bunch of foods that they used to like, um, foods that are savory and rich and delicious. Um, and then finally, you might hear that, oh, okay, well, it's only good for weight loss, but it, you know, what about other health? And in fact, we see that it, it really is good for general health as well. And I'll go into how it can help with, again, we mentioned diabetes, but also blood pressure, cardiovascular factors, um, even endurance exercise. And so again, you know, we look at the ketogenic diet and what they really are. So what a ketogenic diet really is, is carbohydrate restricted, 
Uh, people are encouraged to eat fat to satiety. So this isn't something where you need to be you know, adding loads and loads of fat to everything you eat. What we do is we add a bit more fat than we're used to eating, um, and that actually helps people to find their satiation point. So you feel full, you don't feel like you need to eat more. Um, and that actually sort of naturally um, lowers car uh, calories in a lot of people. Um, again, uh, moderate protein intake, which ends up being individualized. So that can be anywhere, you know, maybe 15 to 25% of calories. But it really is based on more your age, your, your sex, your height, um, and kind of an ideal body weight. Um, it's also, it's whole food based. So this isn't something where, you know, we're recommending meal replacements or bars or shakes or things like that. This can really be done through a whole food based uh, approach. And then also, um, you know, ketogenic diets truly are delicious and full of variety. Now, I want to give you some background about the scope of the, the diabetes and prediabetes epidemics that we're seeing. Um, so first of all, we know that about four in 10 U.S. adults have prediabetes, um, and one in seven U.S. adults have type 2 diabetes. Um, so that means that in combination, about 52% of adults in America have either type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. And you know, what this really tells me is that if the majority of Americans are dealing with these issues, that our approach has been wrong in the past and that we need to look at a new way of addressing these issues. So again, we know that more than half of the population now has diabetes or prediabetes, um, but how did we get here? So, you know, there, there are some different theories about this, but, you know, one of the things that we have seen is that, you know, there really was a shift back in the 1970s um, with the introduction of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. So a lot of you probably recognize this food pyramid um, and also remember some of the uh, recommendations that were made. And basically what was, um, people were told is to base their diet on bread, cereal, rice, and pasta. So six to 11 servings of starchy carbohydrates um, and to limit fats and oils. Um, and you know, there's some good evidence that people in fact did make these dietary changes. And again, the results have been very negative. So I mentioned that you know, these, these dietary guidelines were, rec were released in the 1970s. So what happened to things like obesity and diabetes? So you know, what we see in this chart is that unfortunately type two diabetes basically skyrocketed about 10 years after these recommendations were uh, enacted. And so we saw again that people started to eat more and more carbohydrates. And the first thing that happened was obesity went up and then trailing by a few years, we saw this huge increase in type 2 diabetes, you know, going from something that was, you know, maybe 2 to 3% of Americans um, up, you know, past 7%, and it's even beyond that now. Uh, we're also seeing some really staggering costs of diabetes in America. Um, so we see that, you know, diabetes and prediabetes uh, cost about probably about $322 billion per year. Uh, we see that about one in three Medicare dollars and one in five healthcare dollars in general is spent in caring for folks with type two diabetes. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think is, is really um, hits home for people about this is that cost is not just paid for by insurance companies. You know, this is actually paid out of pocket. So if any of you are on insulin, you may have seen that your insulin costs have gone up by quite a bit. Um, the other thing you might see is even if your medication or out of pocket costs haven't gone up, um, we see that things like co-pays are going way up or, you know, whatever in insurance, the, the portion of insurance uh, that you're asked to cover through your employer um, may have gone up with time. So this is something that's really hitting people in the pocketbook. And it's important to remember that, you know, fundamentally, prediabetes and type 2 diabetes are really just diseases of high blood sugar. So that's how they're diagnosed, and that's how they tend to be tracked. And what we see is that, you know, basically, you know, based on uh, fast average blood sugar, that is how people are diagnosed with prediabetes or diabetes. So diabetes would be a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5% or higher, and prediabetes is in that 5.7 to 6.4% range. And I'd like to, to show an example here, I think a really nice illustration of you know, why diabetes is a disease of blood sugar and why what you eat can really affect what happens to blood sugar. Uh, so let's take an example here of someone with a normal blood sugar of about 100 milligrams per deciliter. Now, in your entire body, you have about five liters of blood on average. 
And in that entire five liters of blood, there's only about one teaspoon of sugar that's dissolved throughout that, that whole bloodstream. Um, so, and again, this is with a normal blood sugar of 100, but that's a very small amount, five grams or one teaspoon of sugar in the entire bloodstream. Now let's use the example of a cup of brown rice. So a cup of brown rice is something that definitely would be on the, the base of that pyramid. And we talked about the food pyramid. Um, and what we see though, is that that cup of brown rice is really made up of starchy carbohydrates. So about 45 grams of carbohydrates. And those are really just chains of glucose that get chopped up very quickly during your uh, digestion and turned into sugar. And so that cup of brown rice equates to about nine teaspoons of sugar. Remember, that's in, in contrast to the one teaspoon of sugar that's normally in your blood. So let's think about what happens when you eat that cup of brown rice. And I think it's also really important to note the difference between what happens in a person with high carbohydrate tolerance, like on the left, and a person with low carbohydrate tolerance like on the right. So these two people, let's say they sit down to a meal together and they each eat their bowl of brown rice. So it's important to note that this is the exact same thing they're eating. Right, So they both eat that cup of brown rice and they're going to have an increase in blood glucose. But what happens is the person with a high carbohydrate tolerance has a low glucose spike and their body releases a small amount of insulin to bring that glucose back to normal. Now the person with a low carbohydrate tolerance, they eat that same cup of brown rice, but they have a big spike in their blood glucose. And um, Following from that is they have a big spike in insulin and insulin is circulating for a longer period of time to get that blood glucose back down to normal. So why does that matter? Well, the reason that matters is because insulin, in addition to lowering blood glucose, is actually our body's fat storage hormone. So when insulin levels are elevated, your body is in a fat storage mode. And that means that you know, whatever you're eating or whatever calories are present, those are being stored as fat rather than being burned for energy. And what we, we tend to see with people with, um, you know, and when they progress from say metabolic syndrome to prediabetes to type two diabetes, is it really starts with carbohydrate intolerance and insulin resistance. And what that looks like is, so let's say this person with a low carbohydrate tolerance, um, they, you know, basically are, are eating higher um, carbohydrate foods and because of their own tolerance, they have blood sugar and insulin that elevate over time. And what happens is at a certain point, their insulin is no longer able to get their blood sugar in a normal range and blood sugar all of a sudden, boom, jumps up into, a, um, into the diabetic or pre-diabetic range. And then we have the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and then it goes still again in this vicious cycle. So really what we look to do with our approach is to kind of nip this in the bud, right? To take away the dietary carbohydrates and get us out of this vicious cycle of insulin resistance and carbohydrate intolerance. Now I wanna take a step back also and look at the way that type two diabetes is generally treated um, when someone you know, goes to see their physician. And I wanna emphasize, you know, this is how I was trained, you know, this is how most physicians are trained, and this is really kind of the standard at this point. Um, and I wanna show you how, you know, in a lot of cases, it, it just do doesn't seem to be that effective for people, as again, evidenced by the fact of so many people having prediabetes and type two diabetes. So with this, this standard care, it's really a focus on management. And you see that the, type, the American Diabetes Association, they refer to type 2 diabetes as being, quote, chronic and irreversible. And there was a big study done by a group, Kaiser Permanente, where they took more than 100,000 people and looked at you know, how often people had diabetes remission. So that means off of diabetes meds and a normal blood sugar. And they saw that the rate was about 0.1%. So this means that you know, truly most physicians could go their whole career without actually seeing someone with diabetes get off their meds and normalize their blood sugar. And this is something that I truly see on, on a daily basis. And with this standard approach to diabetes management, um, you know, what we see is that you know, medications tend to go up with time. So you see that you might start on one medication and then before long people are on two, three, four, five or more. Uh, weight goes up. 
And we'll see that actually the very medications that we use to control diabetes actually can cause weight gain. Uh, expenses tend to go up. Again, as I mentioned, it might be your co-pays, it might be your medication costs, but those are costs that are going up and up with time. Uh, we see that eating options tend to be limited. So, you know, people are told to really cut calories, cut fat, cut salt, you know, all the things that can really make food taste good. Um, I, I had one uh, patient tell me that, you know, he, when he was diagnosed with diabetes, his physician told him, all right, your eating plan for the next three months is that if anything tastes good, I want you to spit it out. And obviously that is not a sustainable way to, to eat. Um, and then finally, uh, people are often told with diabetes management that actually and exercise and I love to exercise myself but we know that exercise just doesn't tend to be that effective for weight loss or diabetes control and in fact a lot of our patients really have a lot of difficulty with exercising whether that's due to a busy schedule or you know things like arthritis obesity you know all these issues that make it really tough to to get out and exercise And what I saw, again, when I was trying to lose weight in the past, and what, um, interestingly, many, many studies have shown, is that the practice of eating less and exercising more just does not work in the long term for most people. So, you know, as I mentioned, um, there's this traditional approach to diabetes treatment. And, you know, one of the, the parts of this traditional approach is that um, uh, physicians tend to add medications over time. And those can be used to either indirectly reduce blood sugar, so medications like metformin that you may be familiar with, or to directly increase insulin, um, either through meds like uh, sulfonylureas, glipizide, glimepiride, which cause our body to um, make more insulin, or again, directly increasing insulin through injecting it. But I want to talk about why these medications that are, are typically used um, can potentially be negative for people. And this was, I think, really well shown by this large trial called the ACCORD trial. So the ACCORD trial was more than 8,000 patients with type 2 diabetes. And the idea behind this was that they were going to show that intensive management of glucose with insulin would improve health. And what they saw, first of all, is that the intensive group, so the group of people who were instructed to take more insulin and lower their blood sugar more, um, first of all, they gained more weight. So they gained about five kilograms more or you know, 10, 11 pounds more than the standard care group. Um, and it's really um, you know, important to stress here that these groups were basically randomly assorted. So it wasn't like the intensive arm was lazier or sicker or anything like that to begin with. They were just randomly assigned and strictly due to the fact that they were injecting more insulin, they had more weight gain. And again, that's not surprising because we said that insulin's the, the uh, fat storage hormone. But the thing that was really disturbing and the trial was actually stopped early was that the intensive therapy arm uh, had a higher rate of death than the standard therapy arm. Um, so what we saw here is that the group that was getting more insulin was having better blood glucose control actually was having a, um, was, was dying at a higher rate. Um, and this is something actually just in the news recently that uh, medications, sulfonylureas that are typically used for diabetes as well, um, those have been associated with higher mortality rates as well. So I think, you know, as a physician, I feel you now my first uh, oath is to do no harm. And we see that these medications can potentially do harm in patients. And then if there's another option, if you can treat this with diet and lifestyle, um, that is the preferred method. Okay, so now we've got, you know, kind of a background of what today's standard care looks like in diabetes and the, the size of the diabetes and prediabetes epidemics. Um, now I'd like to go into some of the details of the ketogenic diet and how it can be used for disease reversal. So the first thing to note here is that all calories are not created equal. So, you know, you've probably been told in the past with things like Weight Watchers or others that it's all about counting the calories and it's just calories in, calories out. Um, but in, in diseases like diabetes, that's really not the case because what we're worried about, again, is blood sugar. And we know that different foods affect blood sugar differently. And carbohydrates, 
and yellow hair, those cause the greatest increase in blood sugar. Whereas fat, what we've all been taught to fear for decades, um, actually has basically no effect on blood sugar. So if you want to keep your blood sugar the lowest and, man and manage it, you know, the best way of doing that is to increase fat intake and lower carbohydrate intake. So in terms of the uh, nutritional guidance, you know, we um, at Verda utilize what, again, what is called the well-formulated ketogenic diet. Um, and that actually, uh, we'll go into some of the history of that, but that term well-formulated ketogenic diet was actually coined by one of our scientific founders, Steve Finney, who has decades of research in this area. Um, and what we use with a, a well-formulated ketogenic diet is first of all, again, carbohydrate restriction to achieve nutritional ketosis. Um, we use, utilize a highly personalized approach. So this is going to be based on, you know, socioeconomic, cultural, religious preferences. So some people are vegetarian or vegan. We can work with that. Uh, some people, you know, don't have a lot of money to spend on food and need help with finding cheap options. Um, you know, one of the things that's great is a lot of people don't realize, but fat is actually probably the cheapest energy source. You know, you can buy a bottle of, of olive oil at, at Costco for, and then use that on things like salads and cooking your food in. And it's a really good way to get healthy calories. Uh, we see that, you know, we really work on education and problem solving, not meal delivery or replacement. So what that means is that, you know, we're, we're really trying to teach our patients how to implement this lifestyle and to understand it as best they can. And, you know, this is a, and, you know, it's also, I think, um, a good point to make is that it doesn't mean that you can't utilize things like bars and shakes if that's what works with your lifestyle. So if you find that you only have time for that, we can work with you. Um, but just that's not something that we typically prescribe. Um, and then, you know, we really use an approach where people are allowed to eat delicious and real, real foods until satisfied and without counting calories. So just to note again that a well-formulated ketogenic diet is low in carbohydrates, moderate in protein, and high in fat. And one of the great things about this being high in fat, remember these are just the calories that your body is seeing as well. And when you're actively losing weight, a lot of those fat calories can come from your body fat rather than the fat you're eating. I'm going to show you how that works here. So you've got the dietary fat, again, the use of something that might be in salmon or butter or olive oil. Um, and then we also have body fat. Um, and, you know, even in the skinniest person you might see, they have tens of thousands of calories of body fat um, that they can burn for energy as long as their body is adapted to do so. So what happens is that fat can be transported to the liver where it's converted into ketones. And ketones include beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is sort of the main fuel that we discuss. And those ketones can be used for fuel by the brain, the heart, and the muscle. Uh, so you may have always heard that, oh, the brain needs glucose. And that's true. The brain needs a little bit of glucose to function. But the good news is that in addition to making ketones, your liver also makes more than enough glucose for your brain and the rest of your body to use. Um, but the cool thing is that these ketones you know, can be burned basically at the same time as glucose in your brain. And that gives you a constant source of energy. So you're not dependent on you know, your next meal or your next sugar fix. You, know, you really can burn fat on a constant basis and keep a um, kind of a steady flow of energy. Now, it's really important to note the differences here between diabetic ketoacidosis and nutritional ketosis. So this is something that is commonly mixed up even by endocrinologists, other physicians, dietitians, but it, it's really important to make this differentiation. So the important thing here is that diabetic ketoacidosis is a pathologic condition that occurs rarely when you have someone with type 1 diabetes, so someone whose body does not produce enough insulin anymore. And when they are not able to produce enough insulin, basically ketone levels go very high, so oftentimes above 10 millimolar. Um, and then you have all other negative effects um, that, off, you know, that require hospitalization. However, nutritional ketosis is about 10 times lower than that, that amount. And what this is, you know, it's like comparing anything, whether you're looking at blood sugar, whether you're looking at potassium, you know, a, whole, a, a lot is bad and potentially deadly. 
um, little to a moderate amount is actually fine and is, you know, in this case, again, we, we think optimal. So when someone is in this optimal ketone zone, which is a, which occurs through restricting carbohydrates, um, again, this, this is producing a constant source of energy for the body. One of the things that's really interesting is that there is actually a long history of the use of ketogenic diets um, from everything from uh, epilepsy uh, to diabetes. And what we see is that actually before insulin was invented more than 100 years ago, uh, the preferred way of treating diabetes was through a low carbohydrate diet. Um, so you can see in the picture here, Elliot Jocelyn, uh, he founded the Jocelyn Diabetes Center at Harvard. And what he actually treated his own mother with diabetes um, by utilizing a low carbohydrate diet. Um, and you can look back at some of these old cookbooks they have for people with diabetes and see that you know they actually had had the right ideas. They had you know the foods to base the diet on were things like butter, olive oil, cheese, um, and the things to avoid were things that raise blood sugar. Right, sugars, pies, puddings, flour, bread, biscuits. Um, so this has been something, again, it's used in diabetes, but in addition, they're, you know, at the Johns Hopkins, they've been using a ketogenic diet to treat uh, epilepsy for quite some time as well. And there's good data with decades and decades of, of research showing that this is something that's safe and well tolerated. So the next question we often get is, well, is there really science behind carbohydrate restriction? Are there scientific studies that support the use of carbohydrate restriction with type 2 diabetes? And the amazing thing that you know, really a lot of people overlook is that there's, there's actually a huge amount of data showing that this is safe and effective. So, you know, we see 20 randomized controlled trials. So those are kind of gold standard of research. Uh, five meta-analyses. So meta-analyses are where you take a bunch of smaller studies and combine them to get uh, sort of the, the best look at how things are um, have, have performed. Um, Ten other published trials, and all of these support carbohydrate restriction for diabetes treatment. Um, and the funny thing is that, you know, if you really think about it, it is such a common sense approach to treating diabetes. So again, diabetes is a disease of elevated blood sugars. How can you uh, treat elevated blood sugars? Well, you can eat less sugar and carbohydrates to begin with. So again, it's something that's so common sense, but it's been really overlooked as a standard treatment for too long. And the other thing that's really exciting is that we're actually seeing that insulin resistance is the, the kind of the key piece driving so many different um, types of disease. And that by targeting carbohydrate uh, in intolerance and by targeting insulin resistance, we are actually able to address a whole host of, of chronic disease processes. So this is really like the majority of things that are causing chronic disease in our country and in the world. Um, so again, we know about type two diabetes, but it can also include things like fatty liver disease. Um, we see things like you know, high blood pressure improve with a low carbohydrate approach and even uh, osteoporosis. So all of these things by getting at the root cause, we can see some really phenomenal improvements. And what we really want to try to do is treat food as medicine. And that's something that sometimes gets thrown around a little bit, you know, by, by companies that are trying to sell you a pomegranate drink or things like that. Um, but really, we find that the science supports you know, carbohydrate restriction and a well-formulated ketogenic diet as something that truly works as medicine. And I wanted to go um, into some detail now of the, the data supporting the use of a ketogenic diet. And again, how this has really been, the, the way that we have studied this is, is much like you would study a medication, so through a clinical trial. And the, to give you some background on our clinical trial, uh, so this was done at Indiana University Health in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, and the principal investigator is Dr. Sarah Hallberg, uh, who is one of my colleagues, and some of you may recognize from her TED Talk. So if you haven't had a chance to watch her TED Talk, I would highly recommend it. It has more than 3 million views and really goes into more of the background again of, of why we need to address type 2 diabetes in a different way.
so this clinical trial has been more, more than 200 people um, and the average age of 54 years old, I think the average time that most people have had diabetes, type 2 diabetes is more than eight years. Um, an average weight about 257 uh, pounds. And in the clinical trial, um, we see that um, some of the, the take-home results. So, you know, first of all, we saw that, you know, 60% of the people who completed um, the treatment at one year, so that was more than 80% of people got through one year, um, had, were able to reverse type 2 diabetes. And again, that means glycemic control without the use of diabetes-specific medications. Uh, the average blood glucose improvement was 1.3%. Uh, so that means that if somebody started with a hemoglobin A1C of, you know, say, you know, 7.5, um, that would get them down to 6.2. Um, and we saw that again, 70% of people got below that diabetes threshold. 94% uh, of people on insulin were able to reduce or eliminate usage. Um, in terms of weight loss, we saw a 12% average weight loss. Um, and an improvement in cardiovascular risk factors. So basically there's a 10 year score that tells you how likely you are to have a heart attack. And we saw a 12% improvement in that 10 year score based on people's new results. Um, but we also saw um, kind of interestingly some improvements beyond just the ones in blood pressure and in diabetes specific conditions. Uh, so one thing is we saw lower blood pressure and that's even with taking people off or reducing blood pressure meds. Uh, we also saw again those improvements in heart disease risk factors so better uh, cholesterol levels, better blood pressure, um, other improvements. Uh, we saw reduced inflammation so it was about a 40% reduction in a lab marker for inflammation. Um, and then we also saw improved liver function. So people had reduction in their AST and ALT labs, which are markers for fatty liver disease. We saw very quick results. So we've published both 70-day data and one-year data and are in the, pre, um, in the process of publishing two-year data. Um, and so what we saw very quickly after just 70 days, we saw a 22% reduction in triglycerides. And triglycerides are basically sort of the fat floating around in the blood. Um, and despite people, again, eating more fat, it actually was shown that it reduced their triglycerides because it really has more to do with what the liver is making than, than what we're eating in this case. Again, we had about a 30% reduction, um, I'm sorry, a 30 pound average weight loss or 12% average reduction in body weight. Um, so we know that in terms of this clinically significant weight loss, if people lose more than 5% of body weight, uh, that has been shown to improve a whole host of, of health markers. Um, but what we know is that you know, in most weight loss studies, people lose the weight and then you see kind of a U-shaped curve where they lose the weight and then they pack it back on. Um, but in, in our study, what we're seeing is because we're not using calorie restriction, we're not using overexercise, um, is that people are actually maintaining the weight loss over time and not having any significant regain. So the, the question we brought up again at the beginning was, you know, are ketogenic diets worth the hype? Um, and again, I, I would argue that, you know, the, the recent uh, coverage you might have seen online, um, on the news and other areas, um, you know, sort of talking about the benefits of a ketogenic diet, I think that they are really worth the hype. Um, I think it's really important that people um, utilize a well-formulated ketogenic diet. So again, this means um, basically eating whole foods, getting natural sources of fats. Um, in addition, it's very important, particularly in people with type 2 diabetes and in people on medications, um, that this be medically supervised. So because this is such a powerful intervention, um, if someone is on insulin, for, uh, for instance, or other medications, um, you can actually have a really dramatic drop in blood glucose, and we need to have a uh, physician or other healthcare provider supervising you so that we don't have people drop into da dangerous hypoglycemia, so low blood glucose, or um, low blood pressure. So again, that's, that's some of the, the science behind the approach for a ketogenic diet. Um, and now I'd like to just go briefly into uh, the approach that we use specifically at Verda to be able to support patients in making this lifestyle change. 
So this slide really shows kind of the five pillars of support that we utilize to help our patients really take back control of their health. Uh, so you can see in the center here, um, this is our, our patient, actually a real patient of mine, Wilma, who got off uh, many units of insulin, lost more than 50 pounds, and has kept it off for years now. So, you know, when we're supporting our patient in the center here, um, the, the first thing that we utilize is uh, biomarker tracking. And what this means is that you're going to be tracking your blood glucose, ketones, and in some cases, blood pressure, um, also tracking weight and other symptoms. And those are going to be loaded into our app um, so that we can track these. And these are going to be tracked by both your health coach and your Verta physician. So your health coach is, um, our health coaches are in incredibly well-trained, often dietitians, PhD researchers, nutritionists, who are experts in a ketogenic diet. And they're, again, monitoring these biomarkers and giving you personalized, individual feedback on what you're eating and how it's affecting your numbers. So we don't just give a one-size-fits-all approach. What we do is we start with carbohydrate restriction, we check your blood ketone levels, and then based on what those look like, we then make minor tweaks in order to really optimize what you're doing. Um, the other thing that's really important here is the physician supervision, and this is something that really no other um, similar treatment is doing. And so what happens is, first of all, when you sign up with Verda, you know, you would have a telemedicine, so sort of Skype or FaceTime type visit uh, with your Verda physician, so such as myself or one of my colleagues. And we look at your medical history, we look at your medications, we look at your preferences, and we're able to really base our approach on you personally. And then as you're making the diet changes, your Verta physician is seeing your numbers, so your glucose levels and ketone levels, in real time. And what that means is that, you know, if I see in the morning that your blood glucose has improved dramatically with, um, with the diet changes, then I will be able to reduce your insulin at that moment. So you're not waiting three months to see your doctor to get a med change. You're getting that done in real time. And again, with the absolute, my, my number one, two, and three goals are to keep patients safe. And so we take that very seriously and we monitor very closely. Um, and then so in addition to the health coach, uh, the physician and your biomarker tracking, we also have a vibrant patient community. So people are part of an online community where they're able to support one another. Um, they're able to, you know, offer recipes, um, you know, tips, tips for eating out, tips for travel, um, or just support when you're having a bad day. Um, and all of those things we find very effective for, for helping our patients succeed. And then finally, we have a ton of online resources that are offered for people. And again, I mentioned that our, so our scientific co-founders are really, you know, if you, if you look online or you research this, you know, they're really recognized as the, the foremost um, scientific um, researchers and experts in the field of the ketogenic diet. And so we are able to offer their expertise through a whole bunch of videos, uh, online guides, blog posts, and other ways that you can really, again, learn about this as much as you want. Okay, so now we have some time for a uh, question and answer, and I'm happy to stick around for a while. So again, if anyone has questions, um, you can go ahead and uh, pop those into the, the Q&A box, um, and I'll be able to answer those as we go. Um, in addition, if you have something maybe more specific about your medical, con uh, about a specific medical condition or about your employer, um, you can always email us at support at um, In addition, you'll get some more information after the webinar. Again, you'll get a, a link to the video that you can watch again. Uh, you'll also get a link to sort of your specific employer um, in order to um, apply and again, see whether you qualify. So uh, thank you everyone so much for uh, sticking through with the webinar. Hopefully you learned something uh, helpful. Uh, I, I always find these really fun to do because I often, you know, I'll talk to a patient months later and they'll tell me that the webinar they watched was kind of a turning point. They're thinking about their health or, you know, this was the point where they realized that they'd been given bad info in the past and that with good info, they could really, you know, completely turn around their health. Um, so again, I'm seeing some questions pop up here. I'll try to get to as many of them as we can. And uh, thank you again for joining us.
Okay, so let's see here. Um, first question I have is, I'm kind of looking to the side because I have a second monitor open. Um, first one is, uh, do you have materials about the VERTA program that I can share with my physician? Um, and that's a, a fantastic question, and we do. So we have some, some handouts in addition to uh, our, our published research you know, from a peer-reviewed journal that we we're able to share. So you can always um, email support at vertahealth.com, and you know, either when you, you're starting, we, we supply some of that information, but in addition, um, you know, if you want to get information really before you sign up with VERTA to share with your physician, we're, we're happy to supply that for you. Um, this also brings up an important point, um, and that is kind of how we at Verda um, interact with your primary care provider. Um, and again, so I was a primary care provider for years before I, I joined Verda, and so I understand the importance of primary care and the importance of someone who knows your health in the long term and is kind of the quarterback of your health. And so we are really, um, you know, pushed to um, share information with primary care providers. So similarly to a, a specialty clinic, so something like if you saw an endocrinologist or a cardiologist, um, we will we report back to your primary care doctor with um, you know, medication changes or how much weight you've lost, how much your blood pressure has improved. Um, and we're also uh, available to chat with them if they have any specific concerns. Okay, the next question is, as a percentage of calories, what is me meant by moderate protein? Um, and I, that's an excellent question. So again, we, we really base it on specifically on your, um, you know, on your sex and then also your height. So it's sort of a personal um, protein goal that we're going for. But again, it works out to somewhere between about, you know, 15 to 25% of calories as protein, um, kind of, and also based on your activity levels and, um, you know, baseline meta uh, muscle mass and things like that. Okay. Uh, the next question is, is a ketogenic diet okay for someone who is not, pre -di who is not diabetic or pre-diabetic? Uh, and I, I would answer that in the majority of cases, uh, yes. So particularly in people who are, um, you know, overweight or obese, um, it's incredibly effective. Uh, what we some of it differs a little bit based on employers, whether your you know, employer covers things beyond prediabetes, such as metabolic syndrome or, or obesity. Um, we know that it is, it is very effective. You know, what we would say is that if you are undertaking a ketogenic diet, it's a good idea to talk with a healthcare provider about it, just to make sure that you don't have any underlying health conditions that would, you know, could potentially cause a risk. Um, the one thing we also say is that we know that a lot of times a, um, you know, someone joins Verda and then their spouse or their, uh, their parent or their friend um, sort of also starts doing a ketogenic diet. And that, you know, again, as long as someone doesn't, isn't on a, any harmful medications, if they don't have any, you know, severe ongoing health problems, um, that tends to be fine. I would just recommend that you um, check again with a health provider first. Uh, next question is, is a ketogenic diet uh, less than one year decision or is a long term decision? So it really uh, varies based on your preferences. So what we do is that we offer the support to allow people to maintain a ketogenic diet for the long term. And we find that a lot of people, they just feel so much better, their blood glucose is so much better that they want to continue. Um, on the other hand, some people find that once they lose the weight, once they get their glucose normal, they actually can tolerate a bit more carbohydrates. And what we can do is basically find a personalized amount of carbohydrates um, that allows you to be in your optimal health. Um, and that's going to really differ for everyone and also differ based on your goals. Uh, another question we have is around alcohol. Um, and again, what we see is that, um, you know, it enjoyed in moderation, alcohol can be fine. Uh, the, the key is to really stick to the, you know, non-sugary mixers. Um, and then in addition, um, you know, steering clear away from too, too much beer, things like that. Okay. 
Um, the next question we have is, uh, where can we get the food list? So, you know, the, the very spe the specifics of food, um, that's going to come, you know, once you get on the app and once you, you know, sign up officially. Um, you know, you can also just request, again, from that support at Verda Health or when you're talking to um, you know, an intake call specialist when you initially sign up, they can give you a more, you know, a broad idea of, of what the, the food looks, might look like on a daily basis. Uh, next question is, does drinking diet soda hinder the ketogenic diet? Um, you know, it doesn't appear to. So the, the studies that have been done, you know, uh, we've found that uh, diet soda doesn't tend to cause in an insulin increase and therefore doesn't really tend to affect people in the ketogenic diet. Now, there are always exceptions. We find that because everyone is an individual, some people respond differently to diet soda. Um, some people, it might be that it drives hunger more or it drives their sweet tooth. Um, so we really try to look and, you know, as long as you are having a good response to, um, to diet soda, then it's fine to continue. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, as you are moving to low carb diet, are there any issues such as headache, et cetera, that one could expect during the transition? Uh, so that this is commonly referred to as the keto flu. And you know the thing that we've found is that the things like headaches or feeling really tired, um, those are probably mostly driven by being dehydrated and by having low electrolytes. So we found that during that transition, we have people um, take in more salt, and that actually um, eliminates a lot of the symptoms that people have. Now, occasionally people will still feel a little you know, slow or lethargic as they transition, um, but usually that's just a few days, and then once your body gets used to burning fat, I mean, most people report feeling much better and, and very quickly. Uh, okay, the next question. Um, says, I believe that cancer cells are fed by glucose so that they are starved if one's body is now burning fat as a fuel. Is this true? Uh, so this is a really interesting area of research. You know, right now we don't have the, the big studies that really show this is true. I mean, we know that um, the first part of that, that cancer cells are fed by glucose, um, we know this is generally true. So one of the ways that cancer is tested for is through a PET scan, where they actually use radioactively labeled glucose, which basically goes to the, so the cancer cells take up all that glucose and they light up on a scan. So you know the, the idea behind, um, or, or I guess the promise of, of ketogenic diets with cancer could be that by lowering glucose levels and focusing on fat burning, that we may be able to starve some cancer cells. Now, it's important to note that this isn't something we always recommend if someone is undergoing cancer treatment, that they work with their oncologist and sort of follow a, um, you know, the standard of care approach for, for cancer treatment. Um, but this is something that I really I can't wait to see more research come out about it because I do think that there is um, you know, a lot of potential. Okay, um, next question. Uh, what is metabolic syndrome and does it qualify for Verda? So metabolic syndrome is a kind of a group of conditions. So things like prediabetes, elevated glucose, high waist circumference, uh, high triglyceride levels, um, low HDL levels, and, and others. And so those, you know, again, depending on coverage by an employer, um, can be um, ways to, to qualify. The thing that I would just recommend to you is that if you're unsure if you're going to qualify, I would recommend going through the process, you know, getting the labs done, because we have found a a lot of people who are sort of just over the over the border now um, in terms of qualifying for, for prediabetes or diabetes or other things. Uh, can I get a list of the fats that are good for me? Um, yeah, again, so that's something that would come to you, you know, as you officially join, but we will also send you additional information that you can request about just some examples. But, you know, some of the examples of this would be things like, you know, full fat dairy. So you know, things like full fat uh, whole milk yogurt. Um, you know, it can actually include things like butter, um, olive oil. Uh, avocado, nuts, you know, those are just some examples of, of healthy fats. 
Uh, next question is, uh, how quickly does the Verda diet, uh, quote, wean patient off of carbs? And once this begins, how soon before the weight loss begins? Um, and so what, what we do in our, our dietary approach is that we have people work with their health coach to pick a day where they're going to sort of start the ketogenic diet. And on that day, they basically are going to go down to the 30 grams of total carbohydrates or less and follow the, uh, the, the recommendations. Um, and we found that that's actually easier for most people than it is doing sort of a slow wean. Because what happens is when you're eating a little bit of, or you're eating a moderate amount of carbohydrates, your body craves more of them. Whereas when you kind of go cold turkey, that actually allows people to get over the cravings more quickly. Um, and the weight loss happens quickly. So we see people will lose, you know, sometimes five, 10 pounds in that first week, um, even a few pounds in that first day. Some of that is water weight because your body tends to, um, you know, drop excess water um, and salt during the beginning. Um, but that actually can be a good thing because that can lower blood pressure and have other, and just, you know, by feeling lighter, people oftentimes will have less arthritis and things like that. Uh, this question somewhat answered before, but uh, is a ketogenic diet recommended for long-term use or just short-term use? So there are clinical trials that go out to a year um, for ketogenic diet with diabetes, which show excellent results. Uh, there are low-carb diet um, studies that go out to two years, which is actually sort of the longest that any real dietary studies have gone. And again, those show good benefit. Um, and we are planning on studying our group um, out to five years, and again, have already crossed the two-year um, plan um, point. Um, but this is really ends up being personalized. So um, again, if some people do better at slightly higher carbohydrate uh, amount once they've achieved their goals, um, that can be fine. Um, but we also are able to support people doing this as a long-term lifestyle. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, I've been eating a low-carb diet for about 15 years. I've been eating a ketogenic diet for about three years now. Um, and I find it to be, again, just a, an enjoyable and sustainable way to eat. And I feel best when I'm eating this way. Uh, how do people include so much fat in their diets and what do they eat? Um, so this is something that, again, can be a bit of a difference for people because they're kind of used to eating a low fat diet or aren't used to, to adding fats. Um, the interesting thing is that, you know, because fat is more dense calorically, it doesn't end up actually being, you know, large amounts of fat, it's, you know, ends up basically making up a higher percentage of your calories. And so this could be something as easy as, you know, when you make a big salad, you use a healthy amount of olive oil to add fat. And you can very quickly add a lot of calories and fat through something like olive oil. Um, you know, the other thing would be, you know, like putting heavy cream in your coffee. Um, and so it's not something where you're eating gobs and gobs of fat or eating sticks of butter. Um, it's really having the fat that's, you know, not being afraid of fat that naturally is in foods. Um, and then potentially, depending on how you're feeling, you know, adding a little bit of extra fat with things like your coffee or, or others. Uh, next question is, I am an endurance athlete. Are these types of exercise events something I can do in ketosis? Uh, so this is a great question and something kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, so there have actually been some really interesting studies showing that the ketogenic diet is really effective for endurance athletes. So in fact, there's one large study that was called the FASTER study. It's an acronym, F-A-S-T-E-R. Um, and they basically looked at people doing 100-mile races, uh, kind of endur ultra-endurance runners. And they actually found that these group of people, there was a low-carb and a high-carb group, and the low-carb group had lower levels of inflammation, they recovered faster, um, and they were able to run just as fast or faster as the people who were fueled on carbs. Um, and actually, our, our CEO and his wife uh, recently completed the race across America. So they, they rode their bikes 24-hour uh, uh, in in uh, a group, but um, for 24 hours a day um, and uh, raced all the way across the United States um, and actually won their division um, following a ketogenic diet. So this is something that's actually one of the other biggest groups of people who are utilizing a ketogenic diet um, are endurance athletes. Uh, the next question is, uh, is the Verda program only for individuals with diabetes? 
Um, so, you know, we can try to treat, we, uh, when people are paying out of pocket, uh, treat um, anyone who is interested in doing it, whether it is prediabetes, obesity, endurance athletes, or other, other um, indications. Um, again, based on uh, whether employers cover it, uh, that is going to be individualized based on the employer, and you can, can follow up, um, again, once you get the email. Um, next question is, I tried the ketogenic diet for two weeks and noticed I was increasingly agitated in my responses to my family and friends. Can this diet affect your emotional state? So, you know, this is the potentially when people are going through the quote unquote keto flu, um, can feel lousy. And a lot of that is we really think sort of sugar withdrawal. So, um, the, the bet, what we find though, is when we medically supervise people and give them the support on the right types of fats to eat, um, the, you know, getting their electrolytes right, um, not eating too much protein. Those are all things that people oftentimes go, go wrong with, um, and can feel lousy. And so we've had quite a few patients tell us that they tried a ketogenic diet in the past. They felt like garbage for a week or two. Um, and then when they tried it with us, with the supervision, um, it was much more tolerable and you know, they got through a, maybe a day of bumpy ride and then felt great from there on out. Um, there's a couple of questions sort of around whether, you know, I've not been diagnosed with diabetes, but I'm interested in trying a ketogenic diet. Um, and again, that's something, it, it is incredibly effective. So um, depending on you know, what your goals are, um, we definitely see it's a great um, dietary approach for weight loss. It can help with things like polycystic ovarian syndrome, a whole host of benefits. Um, but you know, again, you'll have to check depending on whether your employer or insurance can cover it. Um, but we are happy to supervise people really with any medical, ongoing medical conditions. Uh, so, oh, the next question. So there was a slide with insulin resistance in the middle, um, and there were diseases that were listed on the right, um, including autism, and so some were grayed out. So does that mean that they were not able to be helped through this way of eating? Uh, so that's a great question, and sorry, I, I skipped past that. Um, what we see is the, the one, the the diseases that were in bold, so things like diabetes, obesity, you know, those are things that have strong clinical trials supporting their use. Um, the things that were great are things that are maybe, um, that are promising for the future. So as again, I mentioned potentially for cancer, um, there have been some small studies that show a benefit with things like autism or Alzheimer's disease. Um, but we wanna be careful not to make claims that aren't backed up by the science. Should also mention that um, you know, we're going a few minutes over here. I'll, I'll answer questions for about five more minutes. Um, if anyone needs to drop off, that is totally fine. Um, again, you'll get a follow-up email with more information. Uh, next question, uh, is a dairy-free ketogenic diet safe? Uh, yes, it is. So we have a number of our patients, either they might be vegan or vegetarian, um, other people who just, you know, don't tolerate dairy products for whatever reason. Um, and, you know, we can basically help you with different choices. So it might be things like almond milk, coconut milk, um, you know, it can be a little bit um, more challenging sometimes just because dairy is such an easy way for people to eat a ketogenic diet. Um, but it certainly is possible. And again, that's why the, the coaching and the individualized support really helps so much. Uh, next question. Uh, how can you tell if you have a high tolerance or low carb tolerance to carbohydrates? Uh, so there are a, a number of ways to look at that. So, you know, one of the ways would be, you know, if you're diagnosed with prediabetes or diabetes, um, that tells me that you have a low tolerance to carbohydrates. Um, because your, you know, your blood sugar is basically no longer able to stay in the normal range, um, with the current levels of insulin you have. Um, but also, you know, again, there are a bunch of other things. So whether that's obesity, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, you know, the, the arthritis potentially, um, that also tend to tie in with carbohydrate intolerance. So, you know, those are other kind of hints that your body might be uh, carbohydrate intolerant. Uh, the next question is, how does the ketogenic diet differ from the Atkins diet? Uh, so this is a question we get pretty often. Um, again, one of the things is that the, the Atkins diet tends to be high in protein. So it tends to be more meat heavy, um, pushes higher amounts of protein, where again, we recommend a, a moderate protein um, and uh, 
again, low carbohydrate approach. Um, also, you know, there are differences in terms of what you're tracking. So with us, you know, we're tracking blood beta hydroxybutyrate levels um, and able to really fine tune it versus an Atkins diet. It's kind of a, you know, a one-off book where people read how to cut their carbohydrates. Uh, next question is, so I would place my blood glucose into your app that is downloaded on my phone. Uh, that is correct. We are working on partnering with uh, glucose meters that are able to upload via Bluetooth. Um, but currently, basically, you're checking your blood glucose and ketones on a meter and then just typing those into the app where that, that data is sent to, to your Verta physician. Uh, another question here is, do you expect most of your patients to get the quote keto flu at the beginning? Um, we actually don't. So that's something where, again, with the supervision, we found that I would say the vast majority of patients don't have any sort of negative symptoms when they start. You know, sure, they might miss bread and pasta and things like that. Um, but really, most people feel perfectly well and don't have any issues when they make the change. Uh, next question is, how are the biomarkers taken and do you supply a meter? Uh, yeah, so the biomarkers, again, they'll, they'll be we supply you with a precision extra meter and, this, and all the strips. And those um, basically, um, you do a finger stick, blood glucose and blood ketones on that same meter. And then again, enter those into the app. Um, another question here is, um, can antibiotics stop weight loss on a ketogenic diet? And if so, how long does it take for things to kick back in? So all kinds of medications we've seen can have negative effects um, you know, on, on ketosis or on weight loss in general. Um, antibiotics doesn't tend to be a big one other than the fact that you're generally sick during that time. So people oftentimes have lower ketone levels when they're sick or, you know, have difficulty losing weight. Um, we do find that, you know, long-term or chronic antibiotics can change things like the gut biome, so the bacteria that live in the um, intestine, and those can make uh, weight loss more difficult in the long term. Uh, next question is, does the ketogenic diet help hypothyroidism, uh, Hashimoto's or no thyroid? So we've seen some benefits where people tend to be, become more sensitive to thyroid hormone when making the changes. Uh, weight loss is also helpful. And actually, if you go to vertahealth.com um, and click on our blog, uh, there is a blog post about um, a whole host of things, but there's a specific one about thyroid. I uh, had a couple of questions about the use of bulletproof coffee um, and whether you could sort of use that in, a, in place of breakfast. Um, and that's something that, that some of our patients do. So bulletproof coffee, for those of you who don't know, is coffee generally with, with some coconut oil or MCT oil and butter. Um, and it's something that basically you know, has a lot of calories. It's high in fat, low in carbohydrates. Um, and, you know, as long as you are hitting your goals. So if you're continuing to lose weight, if your blood glucose looks good, if you don't have time to make a, a regular breakfast, then doing something like a, a bulletproof coffee in the morning can be a, a viable option. Uh, the next question is, uh, how about combining uh, a ketogenic diet with intermittent fasting? Uh, this is great. Um, so this is a question we get a lot. Um, intermittent fasting, one of the issues is that there are some differences in terms of the um, definitions. And so, you know, we, we are okay with what's called time-restricted eating, which is basically, you know, potentially skipping breakfast or skipping a meal, eating in a shorter amount of time, um, or, you know, maybe fasting for anything you know, less than 24 hours. Um, what we find is that long-term fasting can have some potential negative effects. So it um, appears to cause some muscle loss um, and also can cause electrolyte abnormalities. So low potassium, low sodium, and other issues like that. So, you know, this is something where we don't recommend the long fast that a lot of people are starting to do now. Um, but, you know, you can work with your coach to do some, some short sort of time-restricted eating or, or very intermittent uh, fasting. Uh, 
Uh, next question is how often would I test my blood glucose? Uh, so this is really personalized based on your medications and your medical history. So if someone has type 2 diabetes, they're on long-acting insulin and short-acting insulin and maybe other meds, you know, we might be having them test uh, two to four times a day um, and then testing ketones once a day. Um, however, as you get further out um, and people are not on diabetes medications, um, then, you know, testing even once a week or once every few days, it really depends on if, again, if you are hitting your goals. So if you are losing weight like crazy, you're feeling good, you're, you know, everything looks good when you do test it, then we can spread things out. Um, some people like more data and some people would prefer to prick their finger less often. So we really base that on, you know, kind of what you'd prefer. Uh, next question kind of goes along those lines, but it's, you know, how often do you enter your blood sugar info into the app? Um, and again, that would be, again, based, based on your, um, your medical history. Um, most people might enter something, you know, once a day or once every couple of days, once they're stable in the program. It's really that first couple days or first week where there's, you know, more um, high touch interaction. Okay. Well, those were fantastic questions. Um, hopefully um, answered some questions for people. Um, again, I would just recommend that you um, follow up with us, um, get more information as you need it. Um, you know, we're able to really hopefully answer any questions or concerns that people have as they're going through the process. Um, and I look forward to hopefully meeting some of you very soon. So, uh, and definitely, you know, when we have our, our history and physical and online, uh, let me know if you saw the webinar because I'm always uh, looking for, for feedback or ways that we can improve. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. And uh, again, look forward to, to seeing you soon.